options handy. You know, the Hawkesbury River is probably only 45 minutes down the road. I've got Lake Macquarie, which is a fantastic place to catch Mulloway, Newcastle Harbour, which is famous. And, yeah, so there's some, some Port Stephens just up the road, so it's a pretty good spot. It's Mulloway City, isn't it, all that part of the world? <laughs> whether you like you know, fishing the beaches or whether you like the estuaries or the rivers or even you know, offshore on the reefs, there's, uh, there's no shortage of options for the, for the Mulloway in that part of the world. No, beach fishing as well, beach rock, you name it, the river systems. So we've got to give it to you Queenslanders a little bit because, uh, you know, you guys have got <laughs> coral trout and red emperor and all these other cool fish to chase. So we, we've got to take some serious ownership of a few of them and, and Mulloway's one, of course, Snapper's another one that we, we, we probably have a better crack at than what you blokes do. And yes, so yeah. we, we've got to, we're proudly, we're proudly, you know, in Mulloway country here, put it that way. <laughs> You're holding the Mulloway up I as the, as the trophy up. fish. Excellent. Mate. How do you compare the, the southern Mulloway with the uh, the northern black dew, mate? Give us a quick uh, comparison. Look, I've been really quite fortunate to catch um, both of them at quite a big size. Um, you know, uh, the traditional southern Mulloway up to, you know, close on 40 kilos and I've caught black, black dew to 35 kilos, you know, so I've had a bit of a crack at both. Mm. Um, I think if, if we use a rugby league or a rugby union analogy, um, the black black dew are, are built like front rowers. You know, they're big, stocky, heavy built, shouldered fish. And uh, and and I reckon the the, the southern mulloway is more like a second rower. You know, that's how I sort mm. of look at them. Um, I think that the, the issue with 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 um, black dew is where you catch them. Quite often, um, there's a lot of heavy cover nearby, and uh, you do need to fish quite heavy just to extract them away from the cover. But they are, and I don't know, they're both tough. You get any fish that weighs thirty five kilos and try and hand it. Hand it your objective and not not take a <laughs> lesson from them. Then you're generally going to come out second best. So uh, I, I would I'd say pound for pound, I may just give it to the to the black to the black fellows there. I think yeah, the black yeah, yeah. Look, they're a tough fish. Unfortunately, they're also a little bit fragile. They don't uh, don't seem to cope with being released as well as the southern mulloway do. Unfortunately, no, not so as tough like Queenslander. They're not as tough as us <laughs> New South. Well, <laughs> so, so unfortunately, they're good if you catch them in the shallow. I've caught, caught them uh, off. The last ones I caught were off Cape Capricorn. I think we're catching them on on seven inch soft plastics in the shallow water, and they certainly released really well in the shallows. But I think, mm. uh, like any you know any any of those sort of mulloway, those demersals, when you bring them up in the deeper water, they can struggle a bit. It's funny. I was catching uh, some nice southern mulloway uh, the other week in forty meters of water. First one we caught up in 40 metres, came up at the same pace on the same tackle as the second one, uh, and it was it was absolutely dead when it made the surface. I was a bit disappointed, so mm. we dispatched that, iced it down, we're going to eat that one. The next one, uh, slightly bigger fish, rocketed to the bottom and about the same catch time, so it's really weird. You know, I'm, I'm not quite sure what I happens guess, to them. I guess fish are individual just like human beings are, mate, yeah. and we, we, all have, we all have different stages of our health. Oh, that's and, it. Uh, yeah, so as, as my wife will probably point out, I probably need to look a little bit more at my health at the moment. So <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll move on from that. Yeah, we won't well on that one. Let's go. We, we, we won't, mate. We're, gonna, we're talking happy stuff. We're talking fishing for Mulloway. So welcome along. We've got Jim and Corey and, and Miro Fish with us. So great to have you guys here. Let us know where you're coming in from, guys. Just type something into the into the chat there so we know where you're coming in from. We're going to make a start, Guesty. So. I've got some uh, some screenshots that you've sent through for us to have a bit of a, a, a sticky at. So yeah. let me put one of those up. I'm just going to uh, kind of make a switch here. So bear with me as I work with the technology. So this first one, mate, you're talking all about how dewfish are, you know, such a, <laughs> a school fish. Yeah, I think one of the big things you've got to remember is that at times, and I know I've suffered it before when I've looked at my sounder, and I think we don't believe what we see. I think that's definitely an issue with people with sounders in general. Mm -hmm. With sonar, um, you know, whether you're using a Lowrance product, which you should be, by the way, or not. But, but really, I think people struggle to believe the amount of what they see. And and um, uh, that school of Mulloway there, I actually didn't shoot that vision. I had a mate of mine who was diving at the time. Uh, I was busy making television, but he, he he was diving at the time. And over a 200 metre length, there was probably 500 fish there. Uh, so, so that was good news for me because I was certainly confident I was going to get a bite there somewhere, if you know what I mean. But, <laughs> but, but, um, but just goes to show you when you're looking at your, your sounder, you know, believe what you see because it doesn't, it doesn't tell, it doesn't tell stories <laughs> unless you've got it on simulator mode. And, and I'm sure we've all had a crack at that once in a while, but, but believe what you see, trust in what you can see. And if the fish aren't biting, then it's up to you to change your technique, your tackle, 
the time of day, you know, come back on the tide chains, come back just on, on low light conditions. You need to change it up to have some success. Yeah, good stuff. All right, mate. Look, we've got a whole bunch of guys checking in now. Tremendous to, to have you all here. So thank you for coming along. And one of the guys who's just checked in is Craig Engler, and that's fortuitous, mate, because Craig's posted a question. So okay. I'm just going to pop Craig's question up on the screen, and we might have a bit of a stab at addressing that one, hey? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So Craig's asked us, mate, do actively feeding mulloway sound up differently to inactive fish? Now, for those who saw our, our bit of a promo post or a promo video on Saturday night, we've kind of already started to answer this, but mate, as promised, you've got some screenshots to help us explain it. So once again, let me just switch over and put on that screenshot to help you along. And look, that's a great, a great question, I should say, Craig. And um, yeah, so I'm scratching around looking at a few. So if you look at that, that's probably a traditional sort of a, a screen setup that I would use when I'm targeting Mulloway in my local estuary system uh, on Vibe. So that's from Lake Macquarie, that one there. And there's two Mulloway there, one uh, that the bottom fish is obviously bigger than the one that's above here. You can see it a bit better than thank you for that, sir. He zoomed in, so that's really good. And the bottom fish is, is around at 90 centimetres and the top one I, I would imagine 65 to 70 centimetres. So, And you can see those. If you look at the angle of those fish, they're both looking upwards. So whenever a fish is looking upwards towards the surface, then it's generally in a feeding mode. Um, Mulloway that are not in that, that feeding mode will be, you know, uh, swimming around each other in that schooling sort of tempo. Um, they'll be hugging the bottom. They'll be trying to find a bit of a back eddy to hide in the current. But those fish are both actively feeding. Where I actually, so I actually ended up catching, uh, I reckon it was the larger of those two. It was 94 centimetres on a vibe. And just not in that screenshot, but just in that area, they were feeding um, tail schools feeding. So you've got this natural burly trail happening where the tail are chopping up the white bait and that's feeding down into the system. And uh, that's always a good sign for me when I'm, when I'm chasing um, Mulloway and lures. And I caught those fish just off to the side. So I'd say they'd probably been up midwater at some point and then come back down and they're looking for their next attack up. So if they're in that upward facing position, as you can see them on the sand there, A, you need to get excited. Um, B, you're a good chance of getting a bite and uh, and so it's just a matter of working out what they're going to feed on and if you can get your lure or your bait um, presented in in the right mode, then I think you're a really good chance of a bite. Yeah, good stuff, mate. So the next question I have, of course, is uh, how do you tell what bait they're feeding on? Can you say and I'll tell you that? <laughs> well, that's a bit of local knowledge <laughs> too, I think. Yeah, well, in that situation, uh, I caught a couple of tailor on, on topwater lures before I caught those fish that day. Mm. Uh, grab the tail, they, they, they threw up these these clear looking um, uh, white bait that are about 90 mil long uh, to 100 mil long and I was using a 100 mil clear vibe. So I reckon I had that side of it pretty well worked out and I knew roughly what the fish would be feeding on that area just through sheer local knowledge. So so that definitely makes it makes a difference and anyone who's caught Mulloway before knows how fussy they can be at times. Uh, other times they, they'll eat just about anything but I, I know I've had, I've had live slimy mackerel live yellowtail live pike out before and then look in the you know in my, in my esky and there's an old frozen squid there oh yeah dust that off hurl it out bang you catch two in a row on just because it was a squid so you know they can be fussy things at times well they don't follow the rules like most fish you know they, no. uh, they, don't, <laughs> they, they don't listen to us just... bloody things follow rules great that's what they do. <laughs> well well that's right so look that's uh, that's tremendous mate now, look we've got quite a few people that have started to check in now so folks you know, if you do have questions of, of guests as we're going along, feel free to post them there. We'll try and address any questions as they come up. Obviously, we might not have screenshots. So the lesson there is if you're just joining us and you're going to, going to post a question here, maybe next time jump on the website first and post the question in advance so we've got time to prepare for you. So um, well, we can we can tick Craig off. I think we've done, we did a reasonable job for Craig because he was well, in, in, in fact, Craig's just uh, just popped up on the screen saying thanks for your uh, thanks for your answer. No there, worries, Craig. So, well easy, well but... done. All right. Right, mate, let's move on to the next question because we've got a, a couple to work through. So this one comes from our, our friend, Extreme Armchair Angler. So he's asking what the difference is in sonar signature, signature between Mulloway and other species that might be present. Now, uh, John left quite a lengthy email. It was a lot more detailed than this, but he was asking the question about distinguishing between, for example, Mulloway and school shark or Mulloway and large tailor or um, yep. yeah, other snapper, other species that might be in the same vicinity. So let me just bring up your screenshot again, mate, and that'll assist you with. Uh... I think I've 
I've spoken to John by email before, and John, if it's the same John that I think it is, he, he's always got very, very detailed questions, so I'll try and get a reasonably detailed answer. <laughs> yes, that, yes. That, that screenshot you can see there, um, that it, it's, not, it's not actually a screenshot that I took on the sander. It's one that I've grabbed while we were filming. So that fish, um, it was pretty cool. I actually did a, a video for Lawrence um, while uh, about catching that fish, and I was with the guy called Barney who fishes on my show a little bit, and um, we'd caught a few fish the day before in that general area. And uh, the day before, we actually marked four, four mile away, caught three of them all around that metre mark. Well, one was about metre seven, I think, and um, and lost lost another one, had four bites. So that day, we went back in that area. We needed one more fish to finish the show off. So we're, we're looking for mulloway. I want to see, see a mulloway. And when you see one and you know you've done enough fishing, you know it's a mulloway, are you going to get... You're going to get super confident um, about your chances and, and it's good to know that the fish are under the boat. So the thing that I'm looking for when I'm looking at a mulloway, and that one there is probably one of the better sounding pictures you'll get of, of an active mulloway. Once again, if you look at that picture, you can see it's angling up slightly towards the those bait schools. Those bait schools are tiny little tailor, probably only 50 to 60 mil long tailor. So, um, and he he's looking to travel up in slightly deeper water than the other screenshot before, nearly 18 metres deep there. So I looked at that and I went, that is a metre mull away. Um, if you look at that screenshot, you can even see in the on the down scan there with the fish reveal, the shape of it. So big in the shoulders, like you'd expect a, a, a mull away to look for, tapering back down towards the tail and then tapering back down a little bit towards the head. So whereas if it was a tailor, so if they were a 50 centimetre tailor, they're quite thin and streaky. They, they're they more of a pelagic type fish. They don't have a, such a big swim bladder. The bigger the swim bladders, uh, the better the the better the, um, the sonar um, read that you'll get back as well. Um, so I find that, that uh, mulloway, one of those fish that do mark up very, very well, um, even better than a kingfish of the same size. So a metre kingfish uh, doesn't seem to mark as well on the down scan as a metre mulloway. And um, one of the really important things, if you do hook a mulloway, once you you know, or you hook a fish that you think's a mulloway, just turn back, have a look at the screen, um, you know, have a look at that screen. If you get a chance, take a, take a screenshot or you can scroll back through uh, through your through your sander once you land it as well and have a look at what that fish looks like on the sander. It doesn't matter what type of uh, fish you're catching, but that's how I've sort of taught myself to know what to look for. And it's a great question John has because you don't want to put a, invest a whole heap of time uh, in on five school sharks. If you want to catch a mulloway, you're better off moving to another spot. So it's all about it's all about recognizing what you're looking at on the sounder, and then you know if you catch a a, a mulloway that's you know 1.1 meters long, 90 centimeters long, you know ha have a look at your sounder as that fish is coming up through uh, underneath the transducer, and then that will help you identify those fish down the track. Yeah, good stuff. I'm going to come back on the screen now, Matt. We've got a couple of questions from the audience. I'm going to pop a couple of those up. So hopefully we've answered Extreme Armchair Angler's question. Uh, if not, I'm sure we'll both receive an email tomorrow with uh, <laughs> with a request for further information. So, Hi, John. Hey, uh, he's, a, he's a great guy, and, yes. and I yes. thoroughly enjoy his uh, his emails and, and the uh, great advice and feedback he gives me, so tremendous stuff. Now, Matt, I'm going to put up a, a comment that we've just received um, here from Dave Stewart. So Dave's asking, if you're targeting Jews over a hole, where's the best place to drop your line? Halfway up or where? What depth? <laughs> fish where the fish are. A mate of mine, Jason Metcalf, uh, who lives in Bundaberg in, in Queensland, that was his saying. So I'm not going to – I don't own that saying, but fish where they are. And that's where, where electronics play a massive part of it. So if, if, the, if the fish are stacked at one, obviously one side or the other, um, then, then you need to set yourself up. So um, uh, generally, Mulloway like to sit like, – well, they generally hang out in areas where there's a bit of tide, tidal flow, a bit of current. So if I'm, if I'm looking at, say, a hole and the fish are – it's just sort of milling around in there. A happy days because I know they're there to start with. If they're if they're sitting in that pressure edge um, out of the current, then you need to set up backup current and try and set your live bait, your dead bait, or cast your your casting laws. You've got to do the opposite thing. You've got to park down the other end with your with your with your electric motor and then cast back up current. But if I'm let's say I'm I'm soaking a dead bait or a live bait, then you need to set up so that um, allow for that current flow and try and get your your bait right in that right area and and once again what you'll find is um when the current's raging they sometimes they can be uh, you know a little bit tougher a little bit slower um and 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 they may just mill around and be happy to sit there 
but you'll, you'll find if there's bigger numbers, then you've got more of a chance to bite. One will come out, grab your bait if it's in the right spot. But as that tide slows down, this is where it's really cool to keep an eye on your sander, you'll find they'll lift lift up off the bottom. Um, that place, that hole where they're hanging out um, when it's not a feeding time, they may, excuse me, may well leave there and go and hunt the local break wall, um, some other structure, just go charging around around looking for bait and then come back and mill around there again mid-tide change or mid, uh, you know, you've always got those peak bite times early in the morning, late in the evening, through the night, of course, mull away of, you know, fantastic nighttime predators. But um, those tide changes are really, really key. So um, I'll, I'll have places that I, I look at in my local waterways where, whether it be Newcastle Harbour, Lake Macquarie, Port Stephens, wherever it is, and if I go and find mull away there, mid-tide in a hole, as, as the question, you know, and, and they're sitting down on the bottom of the hole and uh, the tide change uh, coincides with the sun going down in three hours' time, then I might leave those fish alone and then I'll sneak back around so I don't drive straight over the top of them and I'll set myself up and then put a bait presentation right where they should be. And hopefully, as you get closer to that tide change, they're more active and you're going to get a bite that way. Yeah, a lot of people don't realise also that fish, like every animal, is actually sleep. So... You know, just because they can't close their eyes, they don't have eyelids, doesn't mean that they don't sleep. And so quite often, I suspect, with uh, with Mulloway, as with many other species, when they're mooching around in that deep water around bridge pylons and things, and you're finding they're just they're hugging the bottom and they're not feeding, they may well be sleeping. When they're <laughs> up off the bottom, you know that they're doing something. They're active. Exactly. Yeah, well, if they've had a big night out and they've, they've fed really hard, they're just not interested. You know, they've got a full belly and they'll... It's, well, it, it, they they, they like could that. be sulking as well because guesty has been giving them a hard time and they've that's, gone, that's gone right. back feeling a bit tired and sorry for themselves. So, mate, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave, for that question. I hope we've answered that for you. I'm going to bring up another question now uh, from Brad. Uh, let me just see whether I can make the technology work. That'll help. Uh, what's the best one? to find dewy marks offshore oh, what's there we go yeah. yeah so what's the best way to find dewy marks offshore what do you look for well the first thing i would look for is i'd see if i could get onto guesty's boat and get a few lat longs off his gps if you can manage that you probably get it can get on a few pretty quick smart you, you might notice that the gps coordinates on those screenshots <laughs> have been photoshopped out and uh i make no apologies for that so <laughs> I'm away one of those fish that, that um, I love giving out information on how to catch them. And uh, I had a guy contact me a while ago uh, via Facebook from Real Action and say, geez, you know, why don't you – I'm really disappointed you don't give the GPS marks out. I'll say, mate, I would be – I'd be dead. You'd become them a funeral, Greg, if I did that because they put away my marks. You know, I've got mates. But, but the greatest thing is if, if you can obtain some knowledge, and that's the best thing about what we do fishing is it uh, every time you go out, you learn more and more, and then go and find your own spot and put it into practice. So hmm. uh, if I'm going to go and find an offshore dewy spot – um, you, it's, it, dewies are a, are a funny thing where you'll find that they congregate consistently in the same area. So firstly, I would try and talk to local tackle stores, find out, and they might say, you know, Grego's Reef out off such and such a point tends to hold dewies. Okay, great. So that's the first thing. If you can if you can get a bit of local knowledge, because some they don't tend to hang on all the areas, but I like to look for um, shallow reefy areas in and around that sort of 15 to 20 metres that, that are close to a beach, close to a headland. Uh, they're the sort of areas, I reckon, where, where Mulloway will stage during the day. You'll quite often find it's your local bait reef. So there's schools of yellowtail, slimy mackerel, pike, um, all of those sorts of fish, big squid might be hanging around there. Uh, if there's un any undercuts or caves, they love love hanging underneath ledges and caves. If you've done a bit of diving like I have, you'll see where they, they like to hang out there. And I reckon that you drive past so many Mulloway where people go to the local bait ground, for example, they, they, they burly up, they catch their bait, and then they move off and go and chase mackerel snapper or go into the deeper water, and you're actually driving past where the fish are. So those those sort of shallow reefs that have access to really good beach structure, I reckon they're a real prime spot. The fish will stage there. When it gets close to dark, they become active. And I know that um, uh, the fisheries tag some... Um, some Mulloway with acoustic tags years ago, and and then they, they start off on a little reef, they go to one headland, they go right down the beach, get to the other end, turn around, hunt right up the beach in the dark and end up back at the same reef as the sun's coming up. So yeah, I think yeah. those spots, that I reckon they're key spots. Anywhere where bait is consistently holding is, is always a good place to catch a Mulloway. It, it, it's amazing how many people go 
catch their bait on the bait reef and then go somewhere else to go fishing when yeah, the, the jewfish are generally right where the bait's caught. Right, so. right left the bait. And the one thing that we do, like making television, we have our fantastic days, which you get to see those on TV, but we have our days when it's quiet too. Don't worry about that. So we're always looking for that bonus fish. And if we're jigging bait, the first thing I have on my rod is I'll have a Paternoster style rig with a three-way swivel and an 8 circle hook in it. And the, the first live bait we catch quite often, I'll just drop it over the side. And you'd be surprised how many times that, that results in, in all sorts of fish, not just mulloway. Mm, so. mm. Now, mate, we've got a whole, whole bunch of questions coming through. So, guys, uh, yeah. don't be alarmed if we're not answering them straight away. We have got a, a few starting to pile up here now, and we'll do our best to get through all of them. So, um, Guesty, uh, we've got Dwayne asking, do the same rules apply for mulloway and estuaries? Yeah, so when so estuaries is a estuaries is a very broad description, and and uh, depends if you're talking estuaries like my lake, Lake Macquarie is different to fishing, uh, you know, a river system that runs out of river mouth. So I do a lot of fishing there as well. So um, I think you'll find that you know whether you're fishing um, any of the major rivers up and down uh, New South Wales, they all tend to hold mulloway at, at some level, especially along the man-made rock walls around pylons around anywhere there's a bit of a back eddy that, that, that they can hold. So um, they're the sort of areas that I'm looking to target because I, I know they're there on, as it gets dark and once again as the tide slows up, you'll catch them right up in the shallow areas. They'll, they'll tend to charge around a little bit further. So looking for, for areas, and you'll find in your local estuary system there's places where the bait tends to hold consistently. So once again, it becomes a feeding station. Um, I know in, in my local lake, Lake Macquarie, there's uh, all sorts of little secret places that people have got where they fish. And they're all bait stations in my book. And what you'll find is that um, is that uh, the mulloway will come and they'll, they'll, they'll turn up on, you know, when I say on mass, it might be a school of eight or nine and will turn up. They'll, they'll, they'll disperse the bait there, harass it, eat some of it, and then they'll swim three or 400 metres to the next spot and, um, and do the same thing again. So they tend to move around a little bit. Uh, so anywhere there's consistent bait uh, is, a, is a really good place to start. Yeah, great stuff. Mate, I'm going to put this next question up. I think it's probably going to lead into another screenshot. So uh, would you like me to bring that screenshot up yeah, for look, you now? Look, for sure. And, and um, yeah, pop that one up. So I'll bring up the screenshot. And this also alludes back to a question that we had before about what, you know, what different fish look like. Um, if, you can get your, um, if you can get your side scan working really well. So if you look at that side scan shot there now, we've got – down scan on one side and side scan. So that side scan shot there um, is a barramundi and you can plainly see their barramundi there around that 80 centimetre size. But you can see as plain as day in that shallow water um, shooting out to one side there that they are barry. You can see the shape of them, um, you know, down, down to that sort of point of your nose, the tail, they are definitely barra. And there's no reason at all. And, and side scan works really well, not only for barra, Murray Cod, but certainly for Mulloway. Uh, as you get deeper, it gets a little bit tougher. But if you're if you're in a, um, a river system, estuary system, that that's uh, in that sort of anywhere from that fifteen meters to five meters, one hundred percent, you'll get those great shadows. If you're if you're spot locked, um, so if you're you're uh, anchored or spot locked in one spot, in it, and you've got a bit of tidal flow there, and you're on somewhere where you, where you're thinking the mulloway are going to show up, I would definitely have that um, side scan punching out. Um, and keeping an eye on it and you'll quite often see a school that might be swimming out 20 metres off to one side so you need to cast a lure out or get a bait out that way as well so uh, let you know where they are but side scans are very very useful tool uh, for targeting mulloway we use it uh, when we're chasing them on lures a lot so when we're either drifting with the breeze or using electric motor to, to move us along and I'm looking down at side scan obviously looking at down scan and um, and so us I'll have the whole three up on on the screen and um, and I I find when I'm hunting uh, big open basin, like sort of flat areas, my local lake, there's big open areas where where you catch a lot of fish feeding underneath um, underneath um, tailor school. So I'm looking for that bait that the tailor's feeding on, then the mulloway are hanging around that. And side scans, you might not always see the mulloway on there, but quite often you'll you'll see where the bait is. You work your way towards the bait, and then suddenly they'll appear on the side scan, obviously on down scan and sonar as well. So firstly, you're looking for those clouds of bait off in the distance, and instead of turning right, it might be the difference between you turning right and left, so at least you're following the bait and, and uh, hopefully finding the dewies that way. Yeah, good stuff. Now we've got more questions pouring in, so I'll bring the next one up. So this one's not necessarily a sonar one, but that's fine. We're happy to talk about dewy fishing more generally. So... 
Uh, Brett's asking, Michael, do you have a preferred scent when you're using lures from Mulloway, for example, gulps? Uh, yeah, oh, look, I think we all know that gulp works exceptionally well on on most fish and and uh, and I, I'd love if they brought out a gulp paste or a gulp scent would be just unbelievably good for when you're using things like vibes. Um, yeah, I think scent can play a huge difference between um, uh, between getting a fish to bite that's that's almost there and one that's not quite there. So, um, so yeah, um, it's, I think he's saying excluding gulps there. Um, I'm trying to think what scent I've been using lately. Sax, I think it's a little um, sax. Mm. Dizzy scent, that's pretty cool. Um, all of those scents seem to work, um, you know, at, at different times. Even S, you know, I'll use S-Factor at times occasionally. You know, it just depends on what you're into. But um, I think the biggest thing is not to rely on it too much. So don't don't think to yourself, oh, I have to cut, you know. I think people get addicted to using that stuff a little bit too instead of really, you know, concentrating on getting an extra cast in and, and making sure, A, that your lure is swimming properly. Um, Vibing is a big thing for Mulloway. So I think it's really crucial to make sure that you've got that lure swimming properly, that you've got an action that they like. Um, I've been lucky enough to fish a fair bit with Harry Watson from Jackal Lures. So Harry and I have had some fantastic sessions catching Mulloway on vibes, and and um, and uh, he took me to school there one day, showing me, "Hey, Guesty, I think you should try this technique," which is which I just love that. So uh, I had a technique that works for me, and I've caught them when he hasn't caught them before when we fished, and uh, we had one one day there we we really I think we caught ten there one afternoon, and just just with a short sharp, you know, up and down vibes. Sure, a bit of scent makes a difference, but it was more about keeping that lure in the in the fish's face and and uh, and and really getting the most out of it, and uh, that's just through practice, I think. So. Yeah, so you're right. You know, if you if you haven't got everything else right, putting scent on a lure is not going to change the result. <laughs> You've still got to be using the right lure in the right way, the right place. It, it, it can definitely help, especially in discoloured water and at night time. You know, it looks right. The muller waves sit there and he goes, "That looks pretty cool. I want to eat it." And hey, listen, it smells pretty good as well. I'll, I'll go through with the whole the whole commitment to the program. So, well, the other interesting thing, a lot of people don't realise that you know, we we human beings have taste buds in our mouths where there's moisture, but fish have taste buds all over the body. So. If you've got a lure with a bit of scent that's just wafting off it and it's close to a fish, they've got taste buds on the side of their face, down their lateral line, on their fins. So they're actually getting a taste of it before they take it into their mouths. And the interesting thing is you'll hear people say with a soft plastic that's got scent on it, oh, let them take it and get a taste of it before you set the hook. Well, they've actually tasted it before it's in their mouth. And inside their mouth, there's very few taste buds. So by the time they've taken it, they, they've already done the tasting. So there's a bit of nerdy, geeky science stuff for you. So Time to, time to set the hook. But it's interesting you mentioned the lateral line. And I know every time I pick a mile away up, they're just such a they're such a cool-looking fish with that, that sort of diamond scale pattern, mm. Uh, mm. The lateral line that runs down. They're like little diamonds that go along there, that purple, bluish sort of colour. And, and they have got a fantastically big, long lateral line there. Now, they're a true predator of the dark as well. So I think you've got to try and use that to your advantage. That's why lures that vibrate and, and rattle can make a big difference. A live bait that's that's really kicking around can make a big difference as well. They so. can sense that from a long way, yep. Yeah. All right, little change of pace here, mate. We're going surf fishing now. So Shannon Perry's asking us yep. for the best moon for catching jewies on the beach. Yep. He's going to be on Morton Island late next month, and he's after a couple yeah. of tips, mate. If I'm fishing the beach, I'm looking for that nine o'clock high tide. You know that uh, that. Uh, so you're looking for when you're talking about moons. I like big tides on the beach. I don't always like. I don't like them so much when I'm fishing. Uh, certainly river mouths and estuaries. I tend to look for that half moon. So I've got the neap tides, but but on the beach, uh, I'm looking for that full moon. I think the night of the full moon generally, right on the full moon, is about a nine o'clock high tide. So leading up to that, you'll get a seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. So that sort of four-day window into and then right up to midnight, you get about uh, six or seven days of those those high tides. The last one you fish might be, uh, you know, uh, a midnight high tide. But any time you can get that high tide an hour or two after the sun goes down, well, I reckon you're in with a chance. Uh, I think the Dewey seem to be more confident about coming right in close. And, and let's face it, you, you know, you, you put a drone up and have a look at a beach and you think you're fishing you're fishing, uh, you know, out far enough and quite often you're not, you know, like there's some fantastic structure that needs a fair bit of water to give them the confidence to come in and hunt. So I'd be looking for those tides for sure. Mm. Mm. There you go, Shannon. I hope that answers your question. I hope you've timed your trip to coincide with those tides. What, what are we the trip. Late next month, we've got, we've got right on half a moon right now as we speak. So we just had the new moon. So we've got a full moon in two weeks' time. So late next month, uh, yeah, he might be back on the new moon again. So there will be a high tide that works in somewhere, I reckon. So Good timing. Good luck, Shannon. I hope that helps you out, mate, and you get a few juries.
All right. So now I'm going to have to read this one out for you, mate, because uh, it's a little bit longer, so it doesn't all fit on the screen. So we've got Peter Newans who's saying he fishes the Shoalhaven River and, and the basin, mainly targeting uh, Mulloway, but he hasn't actually marked any Mulloway on his sounder. So he's saying his fishing areas where he's sure they're present uh, is not having side scan a huge downfall and getting he's getting a truckload of decent flatties, but he's a, <laughs> the Mulloway are eluding him after many hours of casting. <laughs> Welcome to Mulloway Fishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, mate. I shouldn't laugh. Um, St George's Basin. I, I love my in-laws come from down that way, but I love I love fishing there. It's like a mini Lake Macquarie where I fish. So mm. it's a it's a it's a even though I don't fish it as often as I'd like to, I feel like the same techniques that we use work very very well. And and um, <clears throat> Mulloway. Um, you know, I, I quite often wonder whether they're not a little bit skittish in some of those shallower lakes, like our lakes where they, they, they sort of shy off the boat noise. And I know a lot of the fish that I catch, if I if I mark them on the down scan and, and sonar and I go, oh, there's Dewey's there, well, quite often it's too late for me to catch them. So I'll mark them in and then I'll leave them alone maybe for 45 minutes, an hour and come back and then try and fish back up to them. So it's like catching a big snapper on a soft plastic. You know, the big long cast right away from the boat, slowly wafting down, generally is going to yield the big snapper, that sort of straight direct underneath the boat. Yeah, sometimes, but not as often as the big cast. And I think that can be the same with Mulloway. So answering your question, yes, side scan, side scan St George's Basin is definitely an advantage. Uh, it's, as I said, it's a similar type scenario to what I fish a lot at home. Uh, and, and not only will it, show you where the Mulloway are, um, but but um, also show you where the bait's holding and those, once again, the Mulloway aren't going to be too far away. Yeah, cool, mate. All right, well, look, we've got a long line of questions from Matt, Miro, Todd, Reese. They're, they're, they're piling up. I'm just going to switch over, though, because we did have Paul Tull who posted us a question earlier in the week. So I might just go over that but one, you mate. Get, and you get rights over these other guys. So you, you're going with him first, Greg. You're not trading. Well, he, he got so. in early, mate. He sent us a question via email. So you know, really you've did. got a screenshot to share with us. So I think I think we're going to pull rank. <laughs> we're going to pull rank. <laughs> so Paul's saying, how do I detect bait fish schools when the boat's moving quickly? So I'm heading from one spot to another or I'm uh, trolling or whatever, and I want to be able to spot those bait schools. How do I set my sounder up to do that, mate? Yeah. Look, I think the biggest thing is you've got to make sure that you've got a transducer set up properly in the first place. So make sure you get that transducer in that sweet spot, at, you know, at the transom where it's where it's got a little bit of a bit of tiny bit of angle down. About three degrees is really good, so that you've got you've got that nice clean water flow flowing over the face of the transducer. It's the same thing if you wind the window down in your car and you put your hand out and you dip your fingers, you're going to feel all that air pressure go over your hand that way. If you just tilt your fingers up a little bit, you'll feel all that air pressure. And, and it's like lift, you know, same way a plane takes off. So you want that water flow to be running over the transducer. If you don't have that or the transducer's kicked up, um, the faster you go, it doesn't matter. You can have the best sounder in the world. If you don't set your transducer up properly, you're not going to achieve the best picture. So then when I'm flying along at 30, 40 knots, screaming across my local estuary system, quite often if I mark some bait, it'll just be a dead set like a little like a post, a telegraph post that'll just 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 uh, just be really quite a quick mark. And, uh, and then if I turn around and slow down and go back over that at four knots instead of 40 knots, then all of a sudden that, that little bit of a whip mark will be a nice big bait school that's there. So you need to need to keep an eye on that. You, you may have to play around with, uh, depends on your vessel and how your transducer set up, but uh, increase your sensitivity when you're flying along. So have that, have that uh, sensitivity bar up on the side, just crack a bit more sensitivity in there when you're flying along. And then when you pull pull your speed back if you're going to go trolling or you're going to, you know, pull up and, and just cruise around electric motor, uh, then you need to drag that sensitivity back again and, um, to clean that clean the picture up. But as you go fast, you may have to just punch a little bit back in there. But you've got to remember your, um, your, your sonar ping does not go any faster when you're flying along. Your sonar hits the bottom and comes back up. So, so uh, you're only marking uh, every so often. So when you slow down, then you can really sort of create that picture that you want to see. So. There you go, Paul. I hope that um, that helps helps you out, mate. If not, you know, if you if you're listening in, by all means, post a question there. We'll make sure that we get to it before the night's out. So, on to the next one, Guesty. Here we go. So we've got Miro Fish. How do you determine the nature of the surface you're fishing using your sounder? So how do you know if you're fishing reef, rock, sand, mud, those kinds of things? Yeah. Well, you'll you'll see if uh, you look at your conventional sonar picture there. 
um, you, you'll see the colour change in there. So uh, if you're on that sort of ready, I, I quite often use that standard colour that they, they come with. I play around with palettes. I'm not, not a massive fan of some of the colours. I, I like to stick with the, there you go. You can see, see the colour that I've got there. So that bottom in that picture there is quite a muddy bottom and you'll see that there's a thin layer of, um, of that sort of orangey type colour um, there's a little bit of maybe a little bit of weed growing on top that you can see there and then it goes into that darker section so it's a deep mud so if that was hard rock if you look at the color up above on the surface there that um, that really dark red it would look like that and then when you get onto the sand you'll find it actually even in that color palette it'll be quite smooth so it won't have that that ruffled sort of a top that appearance on the surface and it'll be a lighter colour again. So it's really definition of colour tells you how hard the bottom it is. Uh, uh, certainly, um, so so a hard rock is going to be quite a dark sort of red, rich red, dark colour. And then as you as you sort of get into softer uh, softer densities of bottom, then that colour generally lightens off a little bit. Excellent stuff. Just bear with me as I struggle with technology here, guys. It's just too many. Too many buttons, too many buttons to press. It's it's all very exciting, but it's also fraught with danger. So, all right, let's scroll through. We've got so many more questions, so I'm not sure we'll get through all of them, but we'll do our best. So, uh, so Matt Levy is asking us, uh, Guesty, how long do you spend looking for new ground versus actually fishing? Great uh, question, by the way, Matt. I get this one all the time. That's a seriously good question. There's, there is nothing worse and and then spending a heap of time fishing ground when the fish aren't there. So if I, if I'm going to go and fish one of my, if I'm really targeting Mullaway, I'll go and fish one of my local estuary systems. Um, I'll spend an hour sometimes driving around looking to see uh, A, where the fish are, B, where the bait's holding. Um, and, and and I'd rather spend an hour doing that than spend two and a half hours sitting in a spot where there's no fish. So you've got to mark them. It's, it's funny, I remember years and years ago fishing one of my local estuaries and I, I took an older fella out who, who, um, who, who just was was a Dewey fisherman from way back, but he would just go and say, I fish off that point or I fish off this rock wall and this is where I sit and they'll eventually swim past and we'll catch them. You know, it's like, yeah, that's all good, but I'm making TV. I, I need to catch fish and, and I would rather do it this way. So then we drove along. And I, I can distinctly remember it. My young fellow was fishing with me at the time and we marked seven seven fish and I said to him, "That's there's seven Mulloway. And he went, he looked at me like, really? And I said, mate, I'm telling you, there's seven Dewey's. They're not big ones, but hey, they're nice fish, you know, in that 70 centimetre, that maybe 80 centimetres, but mostly in that sort of 70 centimetre. They look about that size. We pulled up there, spot locked. We were fishing with um, live baits. We caught seven mile away. No word of a lie, right? So then we, we, we did that. Fantastic. Then we moved off because he said, oh, I've got this spot up further. It'll be really good. We'll go and have a look. Anyway, I had side scan punching right out. It was quite a shallow area. It was only probably seven, six to seven metres deep. I drove around there. I didn't mark a single fish, not a fish. And we had lunch up there. And I said, mate, I said, I haven't, we had some baits out. And I said, oh, mate, oh, there's nothing here. Okay. So then we headed back down the estuary system, found another school of Mulloway. There was six there. We caught six more. No joke. We caught 13 for the day. Mark six more. So, so spend time driving around looking for fish, 100%. Spend. Doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that you're going to pull up on a magic school of Dewey's and just catch them straight away. But, hey, mark that in. And, you know, on that part of the tide, they're holding there. For sure, you know, move up, have a crack at them. If they're not biting, then maybe move off. But you, you know, you'll find you'll you'll tend to want to go back there and ha have another crack. But say you're three or four, three hours away from a tide change, I'd go back and spend an hour onto that tide change or the last hour of dark in that area where they are for sure. So, um, yeah. There you go, Matt. Hope that helps. So, um, Todd's asking, mate, how do you work your lures? Do you work them aggressively, or do you work them more subtly? T totally depends on uh, that depends on a lot of things. A, they the type of the, the lure that you're using. I find in um, in when the water's a bit warmer, um, the, the the fish are sort of you know up and active and moving. You can be quite aggressive with your lure. And, and uh, I actually pulled out of a really good mulloway this week. I was fishing around uh, around a heap of bait, cast a vibe out. And it, and it was quite early in the morning, fishing in nine metres of water, and I just got the bail arm over and bang, hooked it up, smoked around and uh, the boat and, and went back underneath the boat and out the other way. It was a good fish, well over a metre. Unfortunately, pulled the hooks on it. Damn it, wasn't happy about that. But but so that just shows you how, how active that fish was. But then if you mark fish, and we've been looking at some different screenshots here today, or tonight, I should say. And they're sitting hard. If they're sitting hard on the bottom with their heads down, then you, you've really maybe, especially if it's a vibe or a soft plastic, you've really got to get it in their face 
and, and perhaps slow that, you know, be more annoying, slower sort of twitches, slow it down and, and try and try and get that to work. And that was, you know, a bit of a tip, as I said, when I fished with Harry Watson, we we're only probably moving our rod tip with our vibes 100 mil, but right 14 metres of water right on their heads and we're actually walking around the boat, keeping it right in their face to the point where I think it was just annoying them in the end and you'd get a bite. Whereas I quite often, I don't mind those long lifts. It's that long lift with a vibe or a soft plastic, bring it up and have it flutter back down again. That seems to work as well. But but uh, the, I guess any time you can keep a lure that, that's A, swimming properly and, and B, uh, has has something about it the fish like and keep it in their face longer, then you have more chance of a bite. So. Good stuff. There you go, Todd. Hope that helps you, mate. So uh, Reese is asking, uh, Guesty, have you ever heard of jewfish being caught in the Tuggera Lakes? No. I, I actually, I haven't inside the Tuggera Lakes. So, oh, the real odd one. I've heard of the pros occasionally, the professional fishermen occasionally netting one. But I do know that uh, they do catch them quite regularly off the beach uh, at the mouth of Tuggera Lakes at the entrance where it runs out in the beach. On the, on, uh, we're only talking about moon phases and and surf fishing so you do catch them there tugger lakes is a very 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 shallow lake like exceptionally shallow uh it's the same um if you look at uh wallace lake up near foster uh once again very very shallow lake and very rarely do you ever hear of a mulloway caught in there but there's plenty of them that get caught just offshore there and down near the mouth where where uh, where wallace lake runs out so i think it's a lot of that's to do with depth um lake macquarie has an average depth in the middle of around about sort of nine and a half meters ten meters st george's basin's got a bit of depth about it so they tend to, to hold their places like port stevens which is exceptionally uh, an exceptionally deep natural harbor then they can move in and out and and go when they like but tugra yeah mate, good luck with that if you catch a good one i'd love to see a picture of it from inside of the lake. if you catch a good one you probably if he catches a good one you're probably not going to see a picture of it though i guess yeah. that's the <laughs> that's the way it works with jury's isn't it or if you take it somewhere else yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right let's move on to the next one so uh so darren's asking uh what color palettes do you prefer or specific that specifically suit uh mulloway spotting what uh what yeah that's a good one I, I like that so uh if we can if we can look at conventional i like that conventional sonar picture because i use look i use down scan to really to really say to me like that's definitely a mulloway there's a few times i've had guys say to me oh i guess is that is that a dewey and I go, oh, no, the arch is not quite right. And then when you look at the down scan, it's four smaller fish swimming along together. So it's a school of Ludrick. You know, if they're all 30 centimetres long, you put four of them together, then suddenly they're 1.2 metres long, you know, or it's a school of Bream or it's a school of something else. But when you, when you, um, yeah, so that, if we have a look at that screenshot there, that's one of my favourite palettes. So I really like that, that sort of, that reds and oranges in my conventional sonar. And then in, down scan i like either the blue or that bronzy color and i love i like the white fish reveal generally uh the blue one there i've actually got the the fluoro green up so that's you know i use that a little bit as well but my favorite one is probably the white fish reveal i think it stands out um you know in bright sunny days uh look the larynx have got those fantastic uh screens where you can see them with your polarized sunnies on anyway but um quite often I, I do like white i don't mind that bright green as long as it's a big contrast between the background i think that's a, that that makes a big difference so yeah okay cool so next question we're going again with uh with color but this time with lures so uh, jai cooper's asking mate what i oh, sorry preferred lures but we've also got one earlier on about colors let me just uh find that one as well so give us a run through on lures and lure colors for uh Sorry, whoever yeah. it was that posted that question about lure colours, I can't find it. But I guess you talk us talk to us about lures for Jewish. Yeah. So probably we're talking about gulp there before. My favourite, um, my favourite Mulloway lure is probably a six six inch gulp nemesis, uh, either in the the pink or the white. The white nemesis is probably a lure that that just seems to be one of those go to lures that really works. Has that sort of that real sort of um, you know that that real sort of winding action out of its tail produces a lot of scent being a gold product uh, that's an excellent one uh, the hollow bellies are back so the hollow bellies are a fantastic lure that Berkeley had years ago and for some reason I don't know in why it happened but we stopped making them or they stopped making them I should say they're back they're fantastic on barra flatties but Mulloway definitely they've got a great rolling action big paddle tail but I guess if I've got a one go-to lure that I'm going to have a lot of confidence in I reckon I'm throwing a vibe uh, so a shimmer fork so fork tail vibes uh, I've used trans amps before over the years um, uh, 130 mil shimmer forks bigger ones in in the sort of slightly deeper water 
um, and the paddle tail vibes if you're casting sort of shallow stuff and working it back. But if you've got any vertical structure you want to work, um, then then definitely um, a fork tail vibe is the go. So they're, they're probably my three go-to go to lures at the moment. And, look, I do a lot of work with pure fishing and with the Berkeley guys, so I tend to work in that genre. But there's a lot of other lure manufacturers that have lures that are similar to those lures. Any, I don't think anyone's got anything similar to golf. But if I, yeah, if I if I had to dead set catch a Dewey and you said, what am I going to throw, I'd be throwing a six-inch nemesis, I reckon. So. There you go. You heard it right here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Trevor O'Dear. Good day, Trevor. How are you going, mate, down there in Newcastle? A good mate of mine. So he's asking... Uh, Guess do you do your slow troll? And if yes, what colours do you use and when? Yeah, so actually I, myself, not no, not a lot. I've, years and years ago I used to do a bit of it, but it's something I want to get back into. But a mate of mine um, up in the mid-north coast further catches a lot of Mulloway slow trolling for them with hard bodies in that sort of 8 to 10 litres of uh, depth of water using uh, DX, uh, the Nomad um, uh, DX hard bodies. He has a great success with those. So in that sort of clearer clearer looking colour, natural, uh, those natural sort of um, natural colours. I, I quite often find Mulloway, you know, yeah, I, I like natural colours for a lot of fishing, but certainly for Mulloway I do tend to like those more natural colours or whites. White's a colour that stands out when you're fishing the back end of the tide when the water's a bit dirty. So, um, yeah, trialling. I have actually caught them downrigging before too, Mulloway. So, um, yeah, so actually slow trialling live baits and um and live squid even on downriggers can be really successful with a bit of, with a little bit of drop back. Uh, that works really well as well. So, all right, let's keep moving. <laughs> <laughs> we've already had that one, so I'll scroll back down. Yeah, I think we've got about twenty five questions still lined up here, guys. So we're yeah, not going to get through all of them. Can I have a scotch and dry while I'm doing this? <laughs> yeah. Just get waited. No, no, no worries. That's why I, I keep going off screen, mate. Well. I'm having a scotch here as we chat. So. <laughs> Not really. All right. So, uh, look, Craig Engler um, coming back out of another crack. So, Craig's asking, would you bother tossing lures at a dewy if they appear to be inactive, or are you better off just coming back later? Good question, by the way. Yeah. Well, I think always you want to chuck a. There's nothing better than catching. If you haven't caught, if you're watching this and you're a bait fisherman for Mulloway, which, hey, don't worry, I've caught hundreds and thousands of them on bait. I love catching them on bait. But if you haven't caught one, and felt those violent head shakes through through polyethylene line through braid, then you're really missing out on something. Especially, excuse me, especially if you can catch one on on, uh, on light tackle. So uh, I would always, you know, always cast a lure first. You can always come back and soak a bait. But if they're not if they're not active, you know, mark them in there. Um, it's difficult if it's in just a big open area, just happen to be float. It's a school floating down the river. That can happen as well at times. But if, if it's on a bit of a bump or a bit of structure, you know that they're in that area, then I'd have a couple of casts at them. Doesn't work out. Maybe come back, try something different, change colours. Uh, maybe change the angle that you're casting at sometimes can make a difference. Um, maybe stay a little bit further away and work your way in towards the fish a bit can also make a difference as well. But, yeah, I do love catching them uh on on lures but i've we've mentioned it already a few times there's those peak peak bite times for mulloway as there is for a lot of our, our fish that we target but um tide changes and those low light conditions that that little window just on and after dark is, is really a gun period so if you can spend that much time on the water cray i'd be going back and having a crack at them then <laughs> all right do Mulloway actively feed in river mouths after big rains, or is that just a myth, Kirsty? No, it is not a myth. It's fed income. That's the time to be there. So what it does, it, it pushes all of that food down and out. And um, I've caught them in Newcastle Harbour in the floods there, like big ones, 60 pounders, you know, so, so 28, 30 kilo fish, and I've, I've caught them there where I've, I've actually caught them. And uh, it, was, it was one time there I didn't have a – uh, like a barrel release weight, and then you, pu you you put your hand in the water and taste it. it is fresh on top. So I've caught them underneath, down in the salt. The fresh is roaring out on the surface, but the salt push, you know, on that incoming, best time to do it was on the incoming tide when the salt was pushing underneath and the fresh is running out and you get this bit of a thermocline in between the two and then you've got you got all this all these nutrients and you've got mullet all being pushed down out in that sort of flood water. And then what I had to do is just quickly fly around out of um, Newcastle Harbour into Stockton Bight, back into the salt water and release them around there because I, I could not get them to re release properly in the fresh water because it's so fresh. So I actually had to, you know, quickly get them in the boat, take off, run around the corner and release them in the salt and they'd swim away, all right, those big dewies. But 100%, um, that, that is a peak bite time, there's no doubt. You'll find most... 
river systems, um, you know, they've got break walls. It doesn't matter where you're fishing at Yamba or Ballina or, you know, wherever you are, uh, Port Macquarie, and there'll be a back eddy that forms, you know, at the end of the wall. That's a really good place to fish where those fish will hold up and actively hunt around in there, and it's a good time to throw big hard body lures, great big pre-rigged soft plastics and, and work. And if you're really lucky at night, you'll hear them buffing the mullet on top, and that, that could be some of the best fishing you'll ever do. But it is certainly not a myth. I'll, I'll, I'll bust that one. So winter coming up, rain's coming up in that part of the world down, yeah. down south. This is the time to do it, guys. So uh, guesty Stephen Farr is asking, when you're fishing deeper offshore waters for Mulloway, do you find they hang near other bait fish, um, meadows, yellowtail, et cetera? Yeah, look, definitely. Uh, we, we, I think we mentioned that before. Any of those offshore reefs that consistently hold bait, uh, and 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 stru- if you can find some structure, Jewies love a couple of things. They love somewhere to hang out. They love going to the, you know, hanging out at their own little pub under the water there where they can hang out. They love easy access to bait fish. So if you've got both of those things, structure and bait. So quite often, some of our, um, I've got a couple of bait reefs that I, I go and catch bait on up and down the coast, and they're just real hard. You'll see it on that on the sand a real hard bare rock but it's a place where the bait will sit i've never caught jewies on those spots you know i just haven't caught them there a i think because there's no cover for the jewies and you've got to think when you're when you're thinking offshore there's some big predators out there like big bull sharks and things that would just love to you know to bite a mull away in half so they do have to they do have to sort of hang together and find a bit of cover so if you can find anywhere where and our modern sounders like i run uh, i run um, active imaging live uh, I've got fantastic pictures, and if you can find a bit of an undercut or a cave or a really good pinnacle that, that creates a back eddy where the fish can sit if there's a lot of current flow, so then A, structure bait, then the jewies aren't going to be far away. Excellent stuff. All right, next question. We're, we're rolling through them now. So we're moving north now, Guesty. We're targeting Ooh. the black jews. Oh, so right. the question is, do you find the best time or when do you find the best time for black dew schooling in the northern central Queensland estuaries? And do they travel a long way up the estuaries or do they stay around the mouth? Oh, gee, you, you know what? You, I'm, I'm on my, I'm nearly on my peas with the, with the black, <laughs> I'm more of an L plate black dew man. So I, I'm going to have a bit of a, bit of a crack at this. But um, from what I, what I know of them, they do move in and out of the estuary systems and, and they do seem to, they do seem to sort of hang around those mouths a little bit like the the, the Mulloway at home. So um, as far as I know, winter time uh, is, a, is a good time to catch them just in and around those sort of uh, river mouths and those sort of shallow estuary offshore systems. And then in summertime when the water warms up a bit, they t- seem to push back up into the into the rivers a bit. That I don't know a lot about them. Um, there's probably better people to ask about Black Jew. It's not something you'd think being cousins – well, sort of distant cousins, I'd know a bit more about them. But when I've caught them, I must admit I've had really good success um, when the water's been uh, sort of that sort of oh, just just um, coming out of winter, sort of that springtime on shallow offshore reefs is where I've found them sort of schooling up around the headlands. So um, what part of their migration period that is, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't like to say. So that, That's it's dry season, of course, yeah. in central Queensland. So that, that's sort of when the water's had a chance to clear up and there's not as much fresh coming down, I guess. Yep. So you've yeah. got you had, to, you had to throw that tricky one in, didn't you? I thought we were talking about <laughs> <didn't> <laughs> Mate, you were just cruising along too well. well you had all well, the answers. Well, so, so I had to uh, just take you down a notch or two. So, <laughs> somebody, might come in, somebody might come in and answer that, which I would love to know as well. So, yep, yeah. that'll be tremendous. Yep. So, Nicholas, I hope that helps in some some respect, some degree, and uh, we look forward to somebody else chiming in with some answers on that one. So, Guesty, the Berkeley hollow bellies referred to as a swim bait. Are they just as effective when they're hopped along as when you slow roll them? Uh, yeah, oh, definitely. You can you can give them a bit of a rip, and then that. But they have this fantastic slow roll. If you watch them, they are just such a great lord. It's why the Barra guys love them so much. Uh, I filmed uh, I filmed a show two weeks ago with a young mate of mine, Jack, and we'll catch. We caught uh, fifteen Murray cod for the session, all on uh, all on hollow bellies with that fantastic big big shoulder roll that they get with that paddle tail. So I think they're most effective in that rolling situation. Um, they're not the sort of lure that you really need to rip too much, but you can certainly give them a good lift and they swim. There's the, the one thing with the hollow bellies, when you cast it out, you're fishing straight away. So cast it out, close that bale arm over or 
I will put your reel into gear if you're fishing with a with a with a low profile bait caster, and then as it sinks, it swims the whole time. You know, it, it is the lure that you are fishing with from the minute it hits the surface. So. There you go. So we just got a comment here from uh, from Callan. Ripstop deep diving Rapala work a treat down south. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Excellent. That's good to know. So, Kelvin Trimble, uh, what settings do you have your side scan on, sensitivity and contrast? Oh, <laughs> gee. How long is a piece of string, Kelvin? Uh, <laughs> we've, got, so, we've got another couple of hours, haven't we, guessed you, to, yeah, to get through yeah, this one? Yeah. So I, I generally have my side scan. If I'm in 10 metres of water, I've generally got it out around about 28 to 30 metres. So I've got it out a fair way. Um, and, and I'm looking for uh, any of those little shadows that, that are way out in the distance. It could possibly be a mulloway or I'm looking for patches of bait as, as well. So um, uh, as, far as, as far as the sensitivity goes or the contrast, you'll find if you pull your contrast up too high, it'll tend to it'll tend to make uh, make uh, the background too light and whatever you're going to mark a little bit too light. So you might have to pull that contrast back a bit so you get, and you can see in that uh, screenshot there now, those barra, everything's pretty well spot on to get those barra pictures like that on the side scan. So th so play around. But the best thing to do is play around with it. It all depends a lot on uh, water clarity and how much water flow you've got, the hole and what depth you're in. All those things play a big part. One thing that you may need to do um, with your engine is trim your outboard up a little bit so that you get a really good picture both sides. Um, you can even see in that screenshot there, we've just got a little bit of a darker line on that side where the barra are because that's 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 um, trying to shoot past the leg of the engine a bit. We've got it trimmed up a bit but not up probably quite high enough there. So if we trim that up further, that leg, you'll see you'll get a cleaner picture. Um, in saying that, I'm not overly worried about what's what I'm seeing just there. I'm more looking out a little bit further, which is where those bar are. So just really, you've got to experiment, and that's a big thing. If I'm giving anybody a tip with um, with using sounders and finding fish and staying on fish, is uh, don't you know I've been in with guys before who say don't don't touch the sounder. That's a setting I always have it on, and I go, oh man, well you're in you're in trouble because the water doesn't stay the same all the time. You know, salinity. Uh, obviously, the amount of fresh water, which is based virtually the same thing, matters uh, salinity in the water, fresh whether how fresh it is, how much suspended sediments in the water, that all makes a big difference. It's the picture you're going to get, and you've got to adjust your settings to suit. So. Thank you for that, Guesty. So, um, hope that answers your question there. Now, we've got a whole bunch more questions coming in. I'm going to take two more, Guesty, and I think we might start to wrap it up because you've been talking just about non stop for an hour. And hey, that's right. I'm not good at many things, Greg, but I go all right talking, <laughs> so that's talking. all right. <laughs> Sure, it's one of the things you're not so bad at. All right, all right well, that's good. So um, we've got two questions that are quite similar here, so I'll just bring one of them up. Um, so this is Mark Newman. He's asking, what's the lightest setup that you use for casting vibes and plastics at uh, Mulloway? Mark Newman. I think I actually know Mark. I'm sure I know Mark Newman. So so uh, three to five kilo. I use a very a seven foot four Ver uh, Abu Garcia a Veritas rod when I'm vibing a lot. Uh, three to five. I like the extra bit of length to just get a slightly bigger cast, and you can get some good long lifts with it. Um, it's still got enough tip to to sort of really you know uh, set the hook. So you don't want to go too light. Um, a mulloway can spit the, spit your lure out just as quick as it bites it in the first place, a little bit by barra. So when you feel that bite, you really do need to jam the hooks in pretty quick. Um, I generally use um, anywhere from eight to ten pound PE in my local system. There, if I'm fishing uh, around structure, I'll, I'll go up to to um, twenty pound. Uh, 20 pound braid and then 30 to 40 pound litres. But in my local estuary, uh, I'm quite often using 8 pound and 15 pound litre. So we fish really light for them, uh, uh, mainly because there's not a lot of structure and they're feeding in and around, um, you know, bait schools a little bit more. Uh, in saying that, I have been I have been dusted a couple of times before, but that's all part of it. But catching a, you know, even a, you know, an 80 centimetre mulloway on that light tackle is such good fun, you know, and they generally release really well and they're, they're, they're good looking fish. And uh, you've been lucky we've caught them up to a metre 26 uh, on that sort of tackle before. So I've caught some quite big ones. And uh, I did actually lose one with my young bloke on that tackle. He fought one for an hour 35. Uh, it towed us 1.6 kilometres and then did us on a concrete barge in the end. And I saw it once. And uh, I don't want to tell you how big that fish was, but it was a mammoth. I think the thing about dewies is they're, they're not like kingies and some other species that are going to bury on a reef. You know, they, they tend to fight fairly clean. They take some pretty long runs. And usually, in my experience anyway, when they uh, when they do dust you on something like a concrete pylon, it's just because they've happened to go past it. The line's been dragged over it, not that they're necessarily diving into it. So, interesting yeah, yeah. 
of views on that. Yeah, guest. This, one, yeah this big one was a little bit different where it just kept wanting to go there. And I actually <laughs> headed it off a few times. So I, I, got, I got in front of the fish off the side, so we were pulling back at it to drive it away. I managed to steer it away that five or six times. And in the end, it just it just went and sat under the barge and just robbed us off, unfortunately. But it was a fish. And I'm going to say, I don't know people listening at the moment, I've caught a lot of big jewies. But it was a fish that was up towards 100 pounds. So that's, it was a mega one, biggest one I've ever seen anyway. So mm. uh, I wish I hadn't seen it. I wish I could tell myself, <laughs> no, it was a foul or something. But it was, it was great to another, see anyway. It was another great. bloody eagle, Ray. Yeah. yeah. All right, mate, last question for the night. So thanks, everyone, for, for posting so many questions. It's been a great conversation. So uh, George Gray is asking, is there, if there's a lack of bait around in Lake Mac, mm -hmm. what else do you look for when you're targeting the, the old Mulloway? Oh, you got to go and you got to go and hit some structure. And at Lake Macquarie, uh, there's plenty of pages that tell you where the artificial artificial reefs are. There's old um, tire barges and, and and things like that. So they're all worth uh, they're all worth a look. So they're all places where the fish will hang around. And you quite often find those some of those those sort of areas. Um, the Mulloway will be sitting anything up to a hundred yards away from there. So don't just rock up on the on the top of that. Look at your sander and go. Oh, there's no one home. I'm going to the next spot. Just sort of do a bit of a slow circle that gets bigger away with your side scan, down scan and traditional sonar going. And you will quite often find that they're held up away from that area. So um, uh, if you can't find bait on your sounder, con conventional bait, uh, you'll catch them underneath the salmon schools and certainly underneath um, tailor schools. You'll find the, the fishing is better underneath the tailor schools when they're held in one area for a while. So they create that natural burly trail. And uh, if it's just like a blow up here and then, they take off and another little blow up can be a little bit difficult fishing there. But uh, I'd be fishing those areas anywhere like any Lake Macquarie is like a massive impoundment to a degree. So anywhere you've got wind pushing on onto uh, any of the rocky points, all those steep rocky points that that uh, and the lake's full of those, I'd be sort of concentrating around there as well if you can't find bait. So. Tremendous stuff. But I guess the, I think we're done. I think we can let you go off and have that scotch and dry. Oh. All right. And, uh, and replenish, replenish your voice box. <laughs> I, think, I think you've earned it, mate. So, look, thanks so much for coming along and, and thanks for being so willing and eager to share what you know. It's tremendous to hear uh, from, a, from an angler of your calibre to get questions answered that, uh, that people have. So it's, it's been brilliant. Uh, we really no, appreciate all, all of that. It's, that's not a problem. I think the biggest thing is like, and, uh, you know, it's always good to engage with people who are interested in the, in the same things that we're interested in. But the big thing is you just, you learn something every time you go out. Mm. So um, that's a big thing. None of us know, know everything. So some of us have probably been sunburned a few more times and had had a few days where it had more days where you've caught nothing. And that's what you get. That's how you learn, you know. You learn just as much from the days where you catch nothing as you do when you have success. But but just um, mull away one of those fish where you've just got to persist, you know. And if you persist and put the time in and think about what you're doing and, and, and learn from your peers, then, then eventually it'll it'll happen for you. So good luck with that. And thanks for everybody who's joined in and and thanks for to uh, to both to Greg and for Lorraine for hosting. It's been good fun. Uh, it's been tremendous i've really enjoyed it and folks of course this time next week we're going to do it all again so we're going to have lee rayner come and join us we're going to talk blue water sonar this time we're going to get into the uh, simrad products and we're going to go off looking for bluefin tuna and sawfish so be sure and join us and i'm going to put some links up in just a moment if you're interested in that uh, sonar masterclass by all means zap along to the links i'm about to give you and enter your questions in advance so that lee's got some time to get some screenshots to help illustrate what he's trying to say, just as Guesty's done tonight. So, Guesty, once again, thank you very much. It's been tremendous, mate. Really enjoyed it, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. I'm sure we'll do that. Thanks. See you, guys. Good luck on the water. See you. Bye.